Chapter Four of The Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Four: The Duplication of Mister Hearty. You've never been a real husband to me," burst out Mrs. Bindle stormily. Bindle did not even raise his eyes from his favourite dish of stewed steak and onions. "'Cold mutton,' he had once remarked to his friend Ginger, "'means peace, because I don't like it, the mutton, I mean. But stewed steak and onions means an ell of a row. Mrs. B. ain't able to see me enjoying myself, but what she thinks I'm being rude to God.' Bindle continued his meal in silent expectation look at you continued mrs bindle look at you now bindle still declined to be drawn into a discussion look at mr hearty mrs bindle uttered her challenge with the air of one who plays the ace of trumps with great deliberation bindle wiped the last remaining vestige of gravy from his plate with a piece of bread which he placed in his mouth with a sigh he leaned back in his chair personally myself he remarked calmly i'd rather not rather not what snapped mrs bindle look at arty was the response you might look at worse men than him flashed mrs bindle with rising wrath i might replied bindle and then again i might not look how he's got on challenged mrs bindle after a few moments of silence bindle remarked more to himself than to mrs bindle god made me and god made arty but in one of us he made a bloomer if i'm right arty's wrong if Artie's right, I'm wrong. If they have me in heaven, they won't want Artie. And if Artie gets in, well, they won't look at me. Mrs. Bindle proceeded to gather up the plates. Thank you for that stew, said Bindle, as he tilted back his chair contentedly. You should thank God, not me, was the ungracious retort. For a moment Bindle appeared to ponder the remark. Somehow, he said at length, I don't think I should like to thank God for stewed steak and onions and he drew his pipe from his pocket and began to charge it don't start smoking snapped mrs bindle rising from the chair and going over to the stove bindle looked up with interested inquiry on his features there's an apple pudding continued mrs bindle bindle pocketed his pipe with a happy expression on his features lizzie he said how could you treat me like this what's the matter now demanded mrs bindle an apple puddin' a-waitin' to be eaten, and you let me waste time a-talkin' about Artie's looks? It ain't kind of you, Lizzie. It ain't, really. Mrs. Bindle's sole response was a series of bangs as she proceeded to turn out the apple pudding. Bindle ate and ate generously. When he had finished, he pushed the plate from him and once more produced his pipe from his pocket. Mrs. B., he said, you may be a Christian, but you're a damn fine cook don't use such language to me was the response uttered a little less ungraciously than her previous remarks it's all right mrs b don't you worry they ain't a-goin to charge that there dam up against you you're too nervous about the devil you are bindle struck a match and sucked at his pipe he's going to open another shop said mrs bindle who oh, the devil inquired bindle in surprise it's going to be in putney high street continued mrs bindle ignoring bindle's remark bindle looked up at her with genuine puzzlement on his features putney high street used to be a pretty hot place at night before the war he remarked it ain't exactly cool now but i never thought of the devil opening a shop there i said mr hearty retorted mrs bindle angrily oh hearty said bindle contemptuously Arty'd open anything except his art or a barrel of apples he's sellin knowin em to be rotten what's he want to open another shop for he's got two already ain't he why haven't you got on stormed mrs bindle inconsequently why haven't you got three shops well continued bindle i might have done so but what should i sell in em you never got on you lost every job you ever got you'd have lost me long ago if no remarked bindle with solemn conviction as he rose and took his cap from behind the door you ain't the sort of woman what's lost mrs b you're one of them what's found like the little lamb that old woe and whiskers talked about when i went to chapel with you that night so long 
the news about mr hearty's third venture in the greengrocery trade occupied bindle's mind to the exclusion of all else as he walked in the direction of chelsea to call upon dr richard little whom he had met in connection with the temperance fate fiasco at barton bridge he winked at only three girls and passed two remarks to carmen and one to a bus conductor who was holding on rather unnecessarily to the arm of a pretty girl he found dick little at home and with him his brother tom and guggers now a captain in the gordons hello here's j b gug gug good cried guggers hurling his fourteen stone towards the diminutive visitor blessed if it ain't old spit and speak in petticoats cried bindle i'm glad to see you sir that i am and he shook guggers warmly by the hand guggers as he was known at oxford on account of his inability to pronounce a g without a preliminary gug gug had taken a prominent part in the oxford rag when bindle posed as the millionaire uncle of an unpopular undergraduate bindle had christened him spit and speak owing to gutter's habit of salivating his words when the men were seated and bindle was puffing furiously at a big cigar he explained the cause of his visit i ain't appy sir he said to dick little and although the im says ere we suffered grief and woe i don't say we got to suffer grief and woe and arty altogether what's up j b inquired dick little well if the truth's got to be told sir i got arty in the throat got what inquired tom little grinning arty my brother-in-law arty i ad him thrust down my throat to-night with stewed steak and onions and apple puddin the stewed steak and the puddin slipped down all right but arty stuck what's he been up to now inquired dick little he's going to open another shop in putney High street that's number three arty with two shops give me l but with three shops it'll be l and blazes gug gug gave you hell interrogated guggers mrs b explained bindle laconically then after a pause he added no matter what's wrong at home if the pipes burst through frost or the butcher's late with the meat or if it's a six-penny milkman instead of a five-penny milkman mrs b always seems to think it's through me not being like arty as if any man would be like arty what could be like something else even if it was a conchy no continued bindle something's got to be done that's why i come round this evening can't we gug gug get up a rag inquired guggers if i gug gug go back to france without a rag we shall never beat the huns for a few minutes the four men continued to smoke dick little meditatively bindle furiously it was bindle who broke the silence you may think i got a down on arty sir he said addressing dick little well perhaps i have but evan's sometimes a little late in punishing people and i ain't above lending an and arty's afraid of me cause he's afraid of what i might say knowin what i know with this enigmatical utterance bindle buried his face in the tankard that was always kept for him at dick little's flat we might of course celebrate the occasion murmured dick little meditatively gug gug great scott cried guggers we will gug gug good old dick he brought a heavy hand down on dick little's shoulder blade out with it for the next hour the four men conferred together and by the time bindle found it necessary to return to his little grey ohm in the west the success of mr hearty's third shop was assured that is its advertisement was assured it'll cost an ell of a lot of money said bindle doubtfully as he rose to go gug gug get out cried guggers whose income was an affair of five figures for a rag like that i gug gug give my my not your trousers sir interrupted bindle gazing down at guggers brawny knees remember you gone into short clothes wouldn't do for me to go about like that he added me with my various veins and bindle left dick little's flat rich in the knowledge he possessed of coming events two anyhow remarked bindle as he stood in front of the looking-glass over the kitchen mantelpiece adjusting his special constable's cap at a suitable angle anyhow arty's got a fine day mrs bindle sniffed and banged a vegetable dish on the dresser she appeared to possess an almost uncanny judgment as to how much banging a utensil would stand without breaking now continued bindle philosophically it's a fine day the sun's shinin people comin out wantin to buy vegetables yet i'll bet my whistle to his old stock that arty ain't appy we're not here to be happy snapped mrs bindle 
"'It ain't always easy to see why some of us is here at all,' remarked Bindle, as he gave his cap a further twist over to the right in an endeavour to get a real Sir David Beatty touch to his appearance. "'We're here to do the Lord's work,' said Mrs. Bindle sententiously. "'But do you mean to tell me that God made Arty specially to sell vegetables in with a face like that?' questioned Bindle. Mrs. Bindle's reply was in bangs. Sometimes Bindle's literalness was disconcerting. "'Did God make me to move furniture?' he persisted. "'No, Mrs. B.' he continued. "'It's more than likely that God just puts us down here and lets us sort ourselves out. Him up there a-watchin' to see how we does it.' "'You're a child of Moloch, Joseph Bindle,' said Mrs. Bindle. "'A child of what luck?' inquired Bindle. "'Who's E?' "'Oh, go along with you. Don't bother me. I'm busy,' cried Mrs. Bindle. "'I promised Mr. Hearty I'd be round at two o'clock.' "'Now ain't that just like a woman,' complained Bindle to a fly-catcher hanging from the gas bracket. "'Ain't that just like a woman. If you're too busy to tell me why I'm a child of old what o'clock, why ain't you too busy to tell me that I'm a child of old what o'clock?' And with this profound inquiry, Bindle slipped out, assuring Mrs. Bindle that he would see her some time during the afternoon, as he was to be on duty in Putney High Street. "'To see that no one ere don't pinch Artie's veggies!' Ten minutes later, Bindle stood in front of Mr. Hearty's new shop, aided in his scrutiny by two women and three boys. "'There ain't no denying the fact,' murmured Bindle to himself, "'that Arty do do the thing in style. If only his art wasn't what it is, and if his face was what it might be, he'd make a damn fine brother-in-law.' At that moment, Mr. Hearty appeared at the door of the shop, bowing out a lady customer, obviously someone of importance to judge by the obsequious manner in which he rubbed his hands and bent his head. "'Cheerio, Hearty!' cried Bindle. Mr. Hearty started and looked around. The three errand boys and the two women looked round also and fixed their gaze on Bindle. Mr. Hearty devoted himself more assiduously to his customer, pretending not to have heard. "'I'll run in about six, Arty, and have a look around,' continued Bindle. "'I'm on duty till then. I'll see they don't pinch your stock.' And he walked slowly down the high street in the direction of the bridge, followed by the grins and gazes of the errand boys. Mr. Hardy's new shop was, without doubt, the best of the three. A study in green paint and brasswork. It was capable of holding its own with the best shops in the West End. In the window was a magnificent array of fruits outside were the vegetables everything was ticketed in plain figures figures that were the envy and despair of other putney greengrocers it was mr hearty's hour as bindle promenaded the high street his manner was one of expectancy twice he looked at his watch and when walking in the direction of putney hill he would turn and cast backward glances along the high street during his second perambulation he encountered mrs bindle hurrying in the direction of mr hardy's new shop he accorded her a salute that would have warmed the heart of a chief commissioner of the police meanwhile mr hardy was gazing lovingly at the curved double brass rail that adorned his window looking like a harvest festival decoration mr hardy believed in appearances he would buy persimmons lychees breadfruit and custard apples not because he thought he could sell them but because they gave tone to his shop those who had not heard of persimmons and lychees were impressed because mr hardy was telling them something they did not know those who had heard of possibly eaten them were equally impressed because he was reminding them of regent street and piccadilly as bindle phrased it mr hardy was a damn good greengrocer mr hardy was interrupted in his contemplation of the fruity splendour of his genius by the entry of a customer at least something had come between him and the light of the sun he turned started violently and stared then he blinked his eyes and stared again a man had entered wearing a silk-faced frock coat of dubious fit and doubtful age a turned-down collar a white tie and trousers that concertinaed over large ill-shaped boots on his head was a black felt hat semi-clerical in type insured against any sudden vagary of the wind by a hat guard mr hearty gazed at the man his eyes dilated in astonishment he stared at the stranger's sunken sallow cheeks at his heavy moustache at his mutton-chop whiskers the man was his double features expression clothes all were the same hello hearty put me down for a cockernut and an onion 
bindle who had entered at the moment dug the stranger in the ribs from behind he turned round upon his assailant then bindle saw mr hearty standing in the shadow he looked from him to the stranger and back again with grave intentness both men regarded bindle good afternoon joseph said mr hearty at length in his toneless voice that always seemed to come from somewhere in the woolly distance good afternoon joseph said the stranger in a voice that was a very clever imitation of that of mr hearty bindle fumbled in the breast pocket of his tunic and produced a box of matches going up to mr hearty he struck a match mr hearty started back as if doubtful of his intentions bindle proceeded to examine mr hearty's features by the flickering light of the match then turning to the stranger he went through the same performance with him finally pushing his cap back he scratched his head in perplexity well i'm damned he ejaculated two arties i want a cauliflower please it was the stranger who spoke bindle once more proceeded to regard the stranger critically i suppose you're what they call an alibi he remarked the stranger had no time to reply as at that moment another man entered in garb and appearance he was a replica of the first mr hardy looked as a man might who without previous experience of alcohol has just drunk a whole bottle of whisky bindle whistled grinned then he smacked his leg vigorously my cauliflower please said the first man good afternoon joseph said the new arrival the voice was not so good an imitation at that moment smith mr hardy's right-hand man thrust his head through the flap in the door of the shop that gave access to the potato cellar he caught sight of the trinity of masters he gave one frightened glance ducked his head and let the flap down with a bang just as a third mr hearty entered he was followed almost immediately by a fourth and fifth each greeted bindle with a good afternoon joseph just as the sixth mr hearty entered smith pushed up the flap again this time a few inches only and with dilated eyes looked out the sight of seven masters as he afterwards confessed to billy nips the errand boy shook him up cruel keeping his eyes fixed warily upon the group of men each demanding a cauliflower smith slowly drew himself up and out letting the cellar flap down with a bang as he slipped to the back of the shop away from the group was he drunk or only dreaming i woke up with one brother-in-law now i got seven cried bindle as he walked over and opened the glass door with white lace curtains tied back with blue ribbon at the back of the shop martha he shouted martha you're wanted an indistinct sound was heard and a minute later mrs hardy appeared enormously fat and wheezing painfully that you joe she panted as she struck her ample bosom with clenched hand my breath it's that bad to-day for a moment she stood blinking in the sunlight see em martha ejaculated bindle pointing to mr hearty and the alibis seven of em you're a bigamist sure as eggs martha and millie ain't never going to be an orphan as she became accustomed to the glare of the sunlight mrs hearty looked in a dazed way at the group of husbands all gazing in her direction then she suddenly began to shake and wheeze it took very little to make mrs hearty laugh sometimes nothing at all now she sat down suddenly on a sack of potatoes and heaved and shook with silent laughter suddenly mr hardy became galvanized into action how dare you he fumed get out of my shop confound you arty arty protested bindle fancy you a using language like that i'm surprised at you mr hardy looked about him like a caged animal then suddenly he turned to bindle joseph he cried i give these men in charge the men regarded mr hardy with melancholy unconcern give him in charge repeated bindle in surprise what for they're they're like me stammered mr hearty in a rage that with a man of more robust nature must have found vent in physical violence well remarked bindle judicially i can't run a cove in for being like you arty although he added as an afterthought he ought to be in quad it's a scandal stuttered mr hearty it's a uh he broke off words were mild things to express his state of indignation turning to bindle he cried joseph turn them out of my shop in in the name of the law he added melodramatically you air sonnies remarked bindle turning to the passive six op it although he added meditatively as he eyed the six duplicates what i'm to do with you if you won't go only evan knows and evan don't confide in me the six figures themselves settled bindle's problem by marching solemnly out of the shop each with a good afternoon joseph 
joseph what is the meaning of this demanded mr hearty turning to bindle as the last black-coated figure left the shop what is the meaning of this you may search me hearty replied bindle i should have called them twins if there hadn't been so many sort o litter wasn't it oh they're all respectable or there'll be trouble for you hearty you'd better wear a bit of ribbon round your arm so's we shall know you bindle you're at the bottom of this mrs bindle had come out of the back parlour just as the duplicates were leaving she regarded her husband with a suspicion that amounted to certainty me queried bindle innocently me at the bottom of what you know something about these men it's a shame and this mr hearty's first day look how it's upset him now how do you think i could make six alibis like them bindle's defence was interrupted by the sound of music well i'm blowed he exclaimed if it ain't them alibis the doubles had all produced tin whistles which they were playing as they marched slowly up and down in front of mr hearty's premises five seemed to have selected each his own hymn without consultation with his fellows the sixth probably a secularist had fallen back upon the men of harlech a crowd was already gathering mr hearty looked about him like a hunted rat he rushed to the shop door desperation in his eyes violence in his mind before he had an opportunity of coming to a decision as to his course of action a new situation arose that distracted his thoughts from the unspeakable alibis end of chapter four read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com